Thank you for joining us this edition. I'm your host, Rex Bear. How would you like to know the forbidden timeline of mankind and our real mysterious origins? Let's go back three and a half billion years. Why not? Might as well. Matthew LaCroix has put the, re, uh, the records, the data, the research together in chronological order. Now, Matthew, he's been on the show a few times previously. He wrote a book called The Illusion of Us. The first time I had a chance to speak with him, it was in regards to that specific book. Great book. He's actually updated it since then as well. And he's working on a new one right now. What we're going to talk about is... Okay, so let's say we go back three and a half billion years. Some people feel that we were just pieces of bacteria back then, bouncing back and forth, self-replicating, mutating, etc. Some people think that the Earth is only 6,000 years old. Some people think, well, I'm not even going to get into that. Matthew, thank you for joining us here at The Leak Project. How the heck are you? Hey, Rex. It's great to be back. I always love coming on here to talk with you. Right on, man. I love your shows. I like the slides you put together. You do it in a very fluid manner. And just to give the audience a quick idea, why don't you give a quick, maybe two, three minute breakdown on what the show is going to be about, and then we'll start getting into the slides. But if you could just give a quick description and we'll go from there. Okay, great. So as when I was kind of doing some writing in the the next book I was doing, um, which is about timelines, I realized that I hadn't really done an accurate representation of the entire kind of story of humanity. And I call this this particular um, show the Epic of Humanity because we really have an incredible history that has preceded us right now. And most people are only, only aware of small parts of it. They're not aware of the fantasticness of kind of where we come from and um, who we really are. And a lot of people, when they do hear some truth, they will immediately reject it because they don't have any any kind of evidence or facts to kind of base it on, to then look at it and say, aha, that makes sense. That's kind of where things fall in. And I think one of the problems with people putting together an accurate, accurate representation of our timeline and where, where certain events fall in with both history and how we've gotten to where we are now is because they don't know where they place we kind of throw all these things out all the time on, on, oh, this is this age and this is this age. And, and nobody's really sure because they don't kind of come together in like a harmony of this is, well, this evidence is objectively pointing to this. So I want to accurately put the numbers based on what so many minds have kind of come to an understanding, looking at our oldest records, not things that we can, um, can, can look at direct, maybe drawings of something and misinterpret, but looking at hard facts, stories that were written that tell us exactly where we came from, um, carry so back using, thousands of years. So you're using multiple stories, multiple uh, cultures, timelines, etc., connecting those dots, and then you've got fossil records, and then you said you were also going to bring information from uh, various extraterrestrial beings that have kind of helped sculpt the modern consciousness currently. Exactly. It's so difficult to understand our entire story unless you can understand all the pieces that that fall in place. So let's try to put this all into a chronological order where we can understand why things maybe are the way they are now and kind of how we got here based on our past. Because you truly can't, if you, if you can't learn from the mistakes of the past, you will always, you'll always be destined to repeat them. And so let's make sure we don't repeat some of these big mistakes that have, that have occurred in our past. Um, so what, you know, there's a great secret that's been kept from humanity for thousands of years about the truth of our past. And it's been hidden in layers of misinformation, control, and the sheer complexity of just how big the truth is. And so let's try to break it up into pieces and try to put them in an order that makes sense. And, tr- and so, um, To start by doing that, we have to realize that the truth is very, very difficult to understand unless you can go look look yourself objectively. So anything we go over right now, you have to go look and go say, okay, I'm going to look at the evidence and say, does this make sense to me? Rather than just listening to, you know, what I say. And that's, I appreciate that. I really hope people do that. And I get a lot of great comments where people, if I make a little mistake, people will call me on it. And I can't emphasize enough how much I love that because to me, the truth is all that matters. I got to jump in on that real quick. It's 
one thing that I absolutely love about the people that listen to Leak Project is what you just said. If there is a mistake made, they will let you know about it. Just a, a few days ago, I got so excited because I discovered this tablet that showed a, a, a nuclear bomb in a mushroom cloud. And I'm like, okay, this is from King Nebuchadnezzar's time. This is incredible. This absolutely confirms a lot of the other scriptures and, and um, parallels that have been put together, dots connected. And then come to find out that it was probably just put together by this jeweler to, you know, to make it look fancy to sell more jewelry. Hey, that's cool. He's doing a great job, great marketing ploy. But I did this podcast and then I got, there was about maybe two or three people that said, hey, I think that, you know, this is actually a, an artist design, look into it more. And man, I'll tell you what, the next day, sure enough, you know, I ate crow. I took that video down and said, yes, um, that, was a, that was not a, a legit scroll that was actually fabricated. And uh, yeah, they'll let you know about it, man. <laughs> well, that's, they will and that's, and that's good. Well, well, that's good, that's good right. though, because it means we have, you have listeners that are objectively questioning what's being said and they're looking for the truth. And you know what? That's exactly. all we're trying to do together. Exactly. You know, as, as, as a collective, we're all trying to find out what the truth is because it's been so hidden and so suppressed and so destroyed in so many areas. So let's together, let's figure this out, you know? And so I am just giving some pieces to the puzzle and we can kind of all decide if that sounds, it sounds logical based on the evidence. And so let's try to put these pieces accurately together. And the first place to start is we have to develop an awareness of the situation we have here on earth. And I want to read a profound quote. Whenever I come across this quote, um, and I've, I even have it in my book, The Illusion of Us, because I just, it's one of the most profound quotes I've ever heard someone speak. And because it's, it speaks to every aspect of what's happened to us. And, and so the quote is, um, Barbara Marciniak gives this wonderful, wonderful quote. Uh, which says, the ultimate tyranny in a society is not controlled by martial law, but the control by the psychological manipulation of consciousness through which reality is defined so that those who exist within it do not even realize they're in prison. So to me, that is, when I thought about that quote and I, thought, and I looked at everything that's happened in our history, in our timeline, in what we are now, it was, it was a very uncomfortable feeling at first because I had realized that the reality that I thought was real was a manufactured reality. And in fact, it wasn't even just manufactured. It was created as a form of control. Let me jump in on that because yeah. that makes me think of the serpent archons, emerald tablets uh, of Thoth, number eight, describing how they work through blood. They work through men and women in high places of power, and they have to have us. So it's like they don't have that creative force. And what you just said, this artificial construct that we're in, it all parallels with what they are doing. Exactly. And, and when you, so when you read a quote like that, and then you look at these elites that are being controlled by these dark underworld, you know, underworld being, dark beings, basically that's what the archons are. They're just these beings that are beyond our even perceptions because they exist in lower dimensions. And they can feed up of our energy and, and they can control those who are weak-willed. And so obviously all we, we see right now in this, in this very disturbed reality where we have leaders across the world that are being controlled by, um, by very dark and sinister things. So we need to tear down these constructs and we need to kind of go towards this new horizon, this new dawn we have here. So let's, let's look at, um, let's go back and let's look at the evidence. Let's see where it falls into. So we're going to go back three and a half billion years right now to where it started, kind of where life started, as far as we can tell, based on, again, on, our, on the records. And what we can tell by looking at this timeline, if we start around three and a half billion years ago, is that the earth had finally cooled. And I say finally because it went through periods where it just refused to cool, and it was thousands and thousands of years of volcanic activity. So when it finally cooled three and a half billion years ago, um, it was able to support some forms of life. Now. The first thing that is very difficult for people to realize is they automatically will stay in this Darwin box that we've been kept in, which says, well, then if a planet reached a certain stage of where it can support life, then maybe it just kind of develops life on its own and then it all kind of goes from there. Always completely ignoring the ideas of outside influence. And, and that's, that's something I want to emphasize the most is that instead of completely staying in this Darwin mindset, we need to break out and think of the idea of 
if Earth is just this planet that exists in the vastness of the cosmos, and let's say it just reached a time where it was cool enough to support life, when you, can you imagine the advancements that some civilizations could have where they could actually map when that planet would reach a stage when it could support life? Then they could travel there and start seeding it. So, we, th so think about that throughout the cosmos, is that advanced civilizations could have planets, early developing planets, all over the stars where they could maybe own or monitor to determine when kind of life needs to be jump-started there. Because as we're going to go into, we've been lied about the properties of evolution. Evolution is real, but it happens in a different way than we've been told. You know, let me jump in on that note yeah. too, because you say three and a half billion years is about the time it took to actually cool off enough. Where do you get the, the records on that? Are there fossil records that show the world actually does start to cool at that point? Or? You can look at fossil records, yeah, and you can see when the rocks literally turned from being like a magma state to finally cooling down across the whole surface. And that was largely due to, you know, it's not, it had nothing to do with the actual surface rock, but had to do with the volcanic activity that was just very upset within this, you know, this cooling developing planet. And so finally, once that, once those, all that surface rock could cool down to that cool temperature, then you could get breakdown, you get soil buildup, and you could get all these things that could then happen. But when you have that, that um, volcanic flows flowing across the land, I mean, life can just never develop like that. So, and, and that's where we start. We start three and a half billion years ago to this time when we see these, we, these developing species start to kind of arrive kind of no, out of nowhere. Um, this is known as microevolution versus macroevolution because it basically means that something is either evolving to its, um, on a small degree within its environment or it's somehow evolving from like a prokaryote or a eukaryote organism. And so the, the, first, the first organisms, the first life we can tell that was on the earth were these prokaryote and eukaryote or organisms. And then of course, from that point, it just, it just went, it went nuts. It leaped, leaps and bounds, and, and of course, that's where most scientists are scratching their head. How could life have spread that fast all over the planet? And then you have these extinctions where it gets destroyed, and yet it just rebounds right, right away. So what's happening, right? Is life just getting destroyed, and then in this, these primordial um, pools of soup, a lightning strike occurs, and then it's able to just, all of a sudden, it goes, goes in lightning speed? No. It's, it's the evidence from what we've seen. If everything chronologically from the, the stories of the ancients all the way through um, cuneiform tablets is that is that genetics may be just simply brought through with DNA, just brought to a place and tampered with and manipulated based on those environments where it could be where it could be placed. You could just look at the earth and you could say, well, where could where should the species be based on its environment rather than where did it develop? Where did it completely develop naturally somehow? So let's go into this a little bit deeper. Planet Earth contains 9 million different species. Okay. Now, half of those species since, since humanity reached kind of the more industrial side have been wiped out. Just think about that. We have wiped out 50% of all mammal and reptile species since, since we became kind of industrialized. We have, we're the cause of the next extinction. We're just kind of destroying all the species that live on this, in this kind of library of life. And that's a very appalling thing if you start to think of it in that kind of um, objective zoomed out view of this planet that is just this incredible life source on this planet. And we're just kind of destroying it as we go. We don't really think about that. So in about um, 200 years, we've wiped out half of the species on the planet that has had life for approximately 2.5 billion years. Wonderful. Isn't that Welcome sad? To the new World Order, Matt. They love <laughs> Isn't us. Isn't that sad? Um, it, it is sad. It is sad. And so what we need to get across is that these species that are here may not even have originated on Earth. They may have come from some other distant place, or there's something that was genetically altered to then to then be here based on our environment. And that's what I want to go into right now. So let's jump into this very bizarre species, right? That a lot of people make fun of, they use in jokes, and it's kind of just laughed at, right? If you travel to Australia, Australia and New Zealand are these meccas of these species that exist, no, exist nowhere else in the world, and they're very strange there. 
And I see Australia and New Zealand as these laboratories where they, because they were so isolated, they created these very unique species. And so look at one of these, these unique species from Australia called the platypus, which if we were to stay in a purely Darwinian model of evolution, it makes no sense at all. It's just, it's a mammal and it's a bird. It, it doesn't make any sense in terms of um, how a species would naturally evolve based on its environment and traits. And then all of a sudden you have this species that's part of two different ones. But the more important thing is it hasn't changed. It's stayed in this state for millions of years. So if, if, if evolution is occurring like we're being told, then why are none of these species really changing? They're simply staying in the same, in the same, uh, in the same place. And, and I want to talk about how this library of life is here. If we, if we think about it in terms of, in terms of the genetic manipulation aspect, then it starts to make so much more sense about how incredibly different and unique life is all over the planet. So bizarre. I mean, so there's some species we're, we're finding in the oceans right now that look like something out of some horror movie or some science fiction show, right? Be, be, and the very premise is that we still haven't even identified um, a, a pretty sizable amount of the species that are on our planet. And, and yet we're, we've already wiped out half the mammals and reptiles here. So that manipulation and tampering of our DNA to control what the planet would be like is, is the key to really understanding um, who these ancient cedars of life, these gods, really were and kind of what their role really, really is in the timelines of species developing and different planets all over the cosmos. Uh, the Hopi, a really good example of this, um, wonderful, wonderful example. I just was down in Mexico talking to some of the, some of these ancient Mayans and they were telling me their origin stories and, they, and, and reading about them. And if you, if you look at the Hopi of the, the Southwest and you look at the Mayans and they talk about their origin stories of these star people, they call them the Pleiades. And they talk about how they came down and they were the origins of where they, of where they originally came from and, and all these things. And then you, then you read about the origins of, of people in Iraq and you read about how they were called, had a different name. So you get all these different God names and you get all these different, these different seedings of life and these different manipulations. So let's try to place these in an accurate, accurate order so we can understand what happened here. Throughout our oldest records and writings, including the Bible, these extraterrestrial beings with far advanced technology, you see uh, paintings that have been done during a lot of these times of, of different religious, of different events that are considered religious, like, um, like Jesus returning or God returning, right? But it's in like a spaceship star. And it's really clear if you start to think about it in a different way, what they were trying to show that these, like a spaceship or some kind of being coming down from the stars. And um, in, in the Bible, they talk about, um, in, in mention in the, um, the New Testament, there's in one place it's mentioned, um, they mentioned plural gods, which is, which is absolutely an amazing thing to think of where everywhere in the Bible, all these versions of the Bible, it's all God, 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 singular. And there's one single location where it's mentioned that there's a plural S on, on that. And so the, if you read the, let me jump in on that real quick. Yeah. You actually read the uh, original translations in the older translations yeah. it says it's plural it's not so, just the singular god what we the version that we have that most people have anyway if you're reading something from the king james authorized version or anything yeah. associated with that there was six corporations that were uh put together that actually did the translations multiple teams etc and then once they had these books compiled and put together and actually translated the way they wanted them to properly then, okay, that fits the parameters. Yes, you can say that. Yes, you can say that. Okay, you need to tweak that a little bit. All right, authorize, get it out under press, bingo. So that's why, and it looks like they slipped on a couple of even the modern version where it says we created man in our image. <laughs> exactly. I was just that's about to say Father that. Father and Jesus and, and they're talking to each other. No. I was just about to say that. Thank you, Rex. Beautifully said. Exactly. So we see these modern writings that tell us our stories of our past have been extremely manipulated and rewritten. And they're just simply based on these old ancient writings, like the Book of Enoch and, and Nagamani Library and all these various things. And so if you go back to the earliest records, you can find out the truth. And, but like Rex says, it's fascinating to note that the Bible still has these areas that where, where truth is still kind of left in there, whether it was on purpose or not. It mentions the gods plural, it mentions how we were created in their image, in their likeness. And 
and it, and it mentions all and many other things that we're going to go into as well. And so let's try to separate myth, myth from fiction and try to find out the truth. And we're, where we're going to start is where it all began. And we're going to start in modern day Iraq, which is fascinating to look at where so many of these wars over the last 20 years have been. And, and all these false arguments given for weapons of mass destruction and, oh, somehow a connection with 9-11 and all these various things that weren't real. And there was never actually a reason why we ever even went in Iraq in the first place, both times, both Bush and his son, Bush Sr. and his son, except for what we're about to go over. Things like vast quantities of gold, things like under, underground um, access points to ma massive underground areas, things like Stargate portals. These, these remnants of an ancient, ancient land, the, the, the first land where, where basically civilization began, mankind began. And, that, and so our oldest place, it would make sense that it has our oldest secrets. And that's what it is. So we're starting in Iraq. And right now, unfortunately, a place that's war-torn, you really can't visit too many of these sites right now. And that's, isn't that very interesting? So good luck coming to some of our most, some of our most ancient sites, unless you want to get uh, maybe in a lot of trouble versus, you know, terrorist groups and people stealing. It's, it's a very dangerous place to visit. And so some of the world's most important archaeological places are some of the most dangerous right now. Just think about that for a moment. So going from Iraq, the first advanced writing that they did was called cuneiform writing. And it basically represented a type of writing that was put into, into stone or metal or pottery that could withstand the elements. If you have something written on paper, it's going gonna, it's gonna to disappear eventually. If you have something drawn on a wall, that, that ink might fade. But if you have something etched in, it's going to last, it's going to last longer than anything else. And, and so when we start there, we see this writing called cuneiform writing. And it was a specific writing style to the Sumerians and the Babylonians. Okay, so out of this region. And the reason I mention that is because halfway across the world, if we go all the way to South America, to the country of Bolivia, we see a major hole in kind of this understanding of, of what cultures are connected and kind of in understanding how these gods could have been um, related to people all over the world and, and how they could have orchestrated them as well. In Bolivia, South America, in 1958, there was a farmer who made an astonishing find when he was plowing his field. Um, he actually stumbled up upon this ancient bowl and the bowl is called the Fuente Magna Bowl. Now, again, one of these things I highly recommend everyone go look up. It's absolutely fascinating. And on this, in this bowl, a Fuente Magna Bowl, which was carbon dated to over 5,000 years old, um, they found cuneiform writing, which I, and I have shown right here, exactly the same as cuneiform writing you can see all the way across the world, crossing the oceans to Iraq and in, in, in the areas of where the humanity began. So you have this common writing style that just traverses the entire planet. And, it's, and, and, it, and this is one of the only places that it's managed to survive. And I suspect there's been many other things that have been found. We're gonna go over some of the, some of the ways that's been lost. Um, if you start looking into the conquistadors that conquered the Americas, from the United States down through Mexico, down through South America, you learn that, that they were sent from uh, the church, you know, through the Vatican. And, and then ha and a lot of the significant amounts of evidence um, from these codexes and various other things that were found were then stored in vaults below the Vatican. And that should be a totally bizarre thing if anyone's thinking about why, if a religious inst institution is being honest like they're telling us, why would they have any need for any of these ancient, um, I mean, countless ancient things from all over the world. It's not just, not just the Americas. The Vatican has, has ancient um, historical documents and evidence from all over the world. But in this case, you see examples where significant amounts of Mayan codexes are stored down there and just kept in, in these vaults below the Vatican. And when we start to, you start to look, see this evidence that it connects all the world, you can see why it's, it's been like that, why it's been locked away and put away, because it just contradicts everything that we're told. And it, it, it sets everything apart. And so this complex writing style is shared by two cultures across the entire world from, from, from dates that are far older than they're even supposed to be there. So let's get to how that happened. The way that happened is if we go back and look at some of the, um, 
some of the stone murals have been left, kind of depicting some of who, were the, who these gods were, these Sumerian gods. And the, the name that they've been given has become a very, very polluted name because there's been such a strong effort to, um, to create misinformation. And, and so that the name given for them has been almost thrown under the bus as something like uh, aliens or um, anything that has to do with a name that's been very um, polluted where now you can't really say it. And that name is the Anunnaki. And it, so some people, when they hear that name, they, they think, oh, I've already heard that that's somehow not real or something very things like that. Because there's been some very powerful forces that have tried to stamp out this truth and not have people connect it. And so we need to, we need to actually set, this, set the record straight for this. When we showed Iraq and being the earliest civilization, they simply called their gods. Remember, the earliest civilization, they called them the Anunnaki. So this isn't a name that came from anyone like Zechariah Sitchin or anyone like that. This is the name that they gave for their earliest known civilization we have of the gods that the story they have of our origins. They called them the Anunnaki, which simply just meant those who from heaven to earth came. And to them, like in the, in the Bible, heaven was always considered space. So those who came from beyond, right? Can I jump in real quick? Yes, just please. Add another dot here because I've been doing some research into the Tibetan uh, philosophies and spirituality. And there are the six cycles of consciousness uh, that one might go through. You've got the nirvana, or actually it's called the diva, the godhood. You've got the demigod realm. You've got the human realm. Then you have the animal realm, and then you have the hell realm. Now, what's interesting is the demigod realm uh, could also be considered the demon realm or the anti-god realm. And the description of the demigods is almost spot on with the Anunnaki that I don't feel uh, that I feel were, you know, there are some type of destiny. I feel that they literally just manifest like boom instantly. Okay. And then they're kind of able to do their thing. So instead of looking at it as who made who and okay, maybe these demigods started as a single cell and then, you know, spontaneously combusted or, you know, multitudes of mutant cells uh, created after other mutant, mutant cells, etc. Kind of, you just talked about evolution. Maybe we just kind of form. You know, like God, the divine source or whatever thought of us that everything was created. Bang. It, was, it wasn't this slow process. And then maybe some of the planets and stuff like you're talking about take time to evolve and stuff. But I feel that our consciousness and the demigods might actually be parallel to the description of the demigods in the Tibetan and the Buddhist type philosophies. Have you looked into that or have you connected the dots on that as well? Exactly, Rex. The demigods and these gods we've heard about all throughout history, these Anunnaki, they're all related. They're, it's all connected. A demigod is just simply an, an Anunnaki or one of, these, one of these great beings that was basically cast down to earth. You know, one of these Anunnaki gods slept with a human woman, and then that offspring is what becomes a demigod. It's not a, a pure god, but it still is a god in many respects. And so the Tibetans, these demigods are as much as gods, pretty much as any gods, and they can control us, our timelines and all these things. And so um, you mentioned some very interesting things, where they exist, right? Where they exist in these different conscious states. These, these, some of these Anunnaki beings, can, can they, they, they can exist in dimensions several times higher than us, which simply, and, and including where they're from, which is what's so confusing about all of this. In our third dimensional linear world we exist in, we can't really, we have, it's such a difficulty for us to perceive something either lower, in a lower dimension than us, which are where a lot of these negative forces originate from, or it's something that's in a higher dimension than us, because we can't perceive either of those two things. So anything that's outside of the perception that we have available, we, it's, it's just completely invisible to us. We are very, very limited by our five senses and what we can actually perceive here. And what that, what that does, is it, it greatly limits actually able to, um, to figure out. And so it's kind of easy to trick us in that way. And so these, these gods that we call gods, they're simply just a, a, fa a faction of beings. Just picture a cosmos where civilizations have developed in various places, and some have become warring empires, and some have become focused on higher consciousness. And there's always kind of this battle between the two. And I want to mention specifically uh, more of the Anunnaki timeline because it's the most, um, the most significant towards ours. 
and we could we could go off on the, the Pleiadian timeline and we, there's the serious there's all kinds of different civilizations you could go off and talk about but the Anunnaki are the most important for our timeline because they manipulated and altered it and the first thing we need to understand is that the, the place they come from the far outer reaches of our solar system exists in a higher dimension than we're in so we at that point the effects of whatever that planet is can affect us because gravity gravity is able to pass through any dimension gravity can go through can 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 transcend time and space and so gravity so that's why a lar if a large mass was to move through a solar system even if that was in a higher dimension and it wasn't even necessarily as close the, it wouldn't matter because the mass of that object could still affect that and that could give it that could affect asteroid belts that could affect comets that could affect things like pole shifts that could affect volcanoes and tectonic plates. There's a, there's a lot more we, we, we need to understand of how uh, a, a distant body interacts based on its mass. That's how we're able to know that this planet exists out there because the two furthest planets that we still have, we haven't downgraded like Pluto, um, Neptune and Uranus, their, their gravita gravity is being disrupted. It's, it's tilting both planets because of something out there some object out there and they can roughly calculate relatively how big it is based on how much it just dis disrupts their gravity and that's what's so amazing about looking when you look at the science of it right and so that's been one of the great secrets that's kept from us and of course this name nibiru another one of these polluted names like anunnaki which i know has been deliberate all it simply means in akkadian to the our earliest cultures it, it simply meant the crossing and when you look at how this invader solar system comes through every, you know, so many thousand years and it kind of bumps up and crashes through things and it crosses through, it starts to really make a lot of sense when you talk about the, the main religions that have come to control this world with the cross, the crossing, this obsession with the gods who have controlled this world. Now let's talk about some of those gods. The most important of those gods to bring up right now because of the influence it's had on our current timeline over the last several hundred years to several thousand years would be the god Marduk. Now, Marduk was uh, the firstborn son of Enki, one of these great Sumerian geneticist gods who became very, very jealous of his younger brother, Thoth. And this jealousy ended up growing and growing and growing until it, along with other things too, until um, Marduk essentially became kind of a psychopathic mad god. And, and we'll, we'll look at how that kind of led to that altering of our timeline. The, Marduk's name in Egypt was Amun-Ra. That name may ring some bells to people. And if you look at some of the early crosses, and, and then you look at some of um, where that name originated from, and, you, and then you talk about, and you look at Marduk and the connections with Jesus and all these things, you start to see this idea that had been created by these gods who wanted to pretend that they were God so that they could then control our timeline. And so every, when people, most, um, most mainstream religions uh, or a, a large majority of the population of mainstream religions say amen at the end of prayers. And amen is simply just one of these kind of sacrifice omens to amen Ra, the same God Marduk. And so we have to start strongly consider that we do these sacrifices with bread and, and, and the, you know, the blood of him and all these things. And, and then you go back and you look at how Marduk, um, you look at the, the evidence that talks about the characteristics of this kind of Jesus figure that erupted and became the, the, the symbol of the church. And you really start to see when you look at like the book of Enoch and you look at all of these and like the Emerald Tablets, and you look at any writing that was based on, any Hermetic writing based on Hermes or Thoth, you see strong similarities, similarities that were stolen from that, right, th that work. Like he was trying to pretend that he was his brother. And, and that's where I see this whole Jesus, the Jesus figure and modern religion coming out of. It's a pretending they were part of this ancient, pure side of knowledge and wisdom, whereas really it's just a deception. And that's very difficult for a lot of people to understand. So this may seem crazy, right? Well, let's, let's look at the evidence for that. And some of the evidence for some of these early, early um, comparisons to where, who these gods were. And 
who the gods were that became demigods is found in these cuneiform tablets. And again, people need to understand what they are. They're our earliest writings. They're the earliest things we have of, of, that tell our story. And the, the one I'm showing right now is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And it, it talks about just his entire story. It talks about who Gil Gilgamesh was and how he was basically one of these, um, almost a demigod. He was a bloodline connector and, and he was a very tall, tall being. Every single one of these epics of a god or demigod, they were all incredibly tall because they were simply mimicking the higher bloodlines of those who came here. And it starts to make sense if you think about, it's very difficult to wrap your head around someone who could be very tall because we can't really perceive someone who's like taller than 10 feet here. But if you think about a planet that has a mass that's more than five times ours, then it would make sense that, that whoever could live there would be a lot larger because you would be, you would be um, supported by the, the relative mass of that planet. Everything is, kind of, everything is designed in a certain way because gravity can affect your mass. So if they were, if, when they come here, if they stay too long, it's been written, you can read this in, in several places, if they stay too long, they can actually cause their aging process to speed up because the, the gravity is so different in two different places. And so let's let me jump in go, for a second, if I, if I can, because you were talking about the Book of Enoch a moment ago. Yeah. And I am absolutely fascinated with the Book of Enoch. I'm reading the three different versions right now. There's an uh, Ethiopian version. I've been reading through the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then there's two additional on top of that. But one thing that I find fascinating is I just want to read this to you real quick because I think it's important. That's in the Book of, the, uh, Book of Enoch. Let me find it right here. Where'd it go? Here we go. The book of Enoch, this describes Noah, and Noah is the great grandson of Enoch. So this is when Noah is born, and Noah's father, Lamech, is like freaking out because he's so bright that the entire house is shining like the sun. Let me read this to you specifically. And after some days, my son Methuselah, took a wife for his son, Lamech, and she, bore, 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 uh, bore, uh, uh, she became pregnant by his son. And his body was as white as snow and red as the blooming of a rose. And the hair of his head and his long locks were white as wool and his eyes beautiful. And when he opened his eyes, he lighted up the whole house like the sun and the whole house was very bright. So his father thinks that he is a product of one of these fallen angels. That's right. And, and, he, I, and he is. It's incredible. It's incredible. It, and we're going we're gonna to talk about who that being you just mentioned was and how his name has been another one of these polluted terms. His name was Noah, but his real name was Atrahasis. And so that it's very, I have to be careful with these polluted terms because it's very easy for people to start laughing when you bring them up because of how they've been portrayed and how our subconscious, how our subconscious has been trained to attack any of these terms. And isn't it funny how the terms that are most polluted are the very ones that lead us to the truth. And so let's go into some of these, some of these stories, like you mentioned, Dr. Hasis and all these things. We, we need to go into these cuneiform tablets to basically tell us what actually happened in our story. The most important set of tablets, in my opinion, besides the Dr. Hasis, is the Enuma Elish. And the Enuma Elish has detailed accounts of how we genetically got here. And so people thinking that's just someone's science fiction imagination needs to, go, needs to go read these. And as Rex knows, you can go to the University of Oxford and you can actually take and translate these yourself. So it's not just um, some, someone's translation like Zachariah Sitchin or any, any one historical figure, but you can actually translate yourself and say, oh my God, I'm reading the actual story from what they said. And what does that story say? That story gives us an, an understanding, connecting to all these other things that I've said before, an understanding of how we got about here and the truth of, of evolution and, and kind of where, where us as a human species falls in, in line with that. According to the Numa Ilish, these Anunnaki beings traveled here around 450,000 years ago. That's almost half a million years ago. So our timeline that we're given right now of 5,000 years when human civilization became uh, more advanced is, is so antiquated that it's going to be thrown out the window very, very soon. 
So 450,000 years ago, the, these beings from this, this, invader, this, this invader solar system, they traveled to Earth, specifically Earth, because Earth has, is, is, it's, one of the, it's what's called an inner metal planet. Uh, planets have different compositions. Some are gas planets, and some are, are metal and rock planets. So if you, uh, anybody's played the game Elite Dangerous right now, you'll know what I'm talking about, which is an amazing game. Um, you can, you basically can determine what resources are on that planet based on, based on its composition. And so these great beings, um, they knew the composition of Earth, and they knew that Earth contained this in incredibly rare element that in large, in large quantities is rare that can, is probably, if you, if you do alchemical research, you'll learn is, is probably the most important element of, of, the, of all the elements in the periodic table. And that is gold, AU. And that may seem silly, right? Because like those polluted terms, um, gold itself is, is seen by most as just something pr pure and rare, uh, pretty and rare. They just put it on their neck and, and that's all it is. That's the entire end of what they know about gold. And whereas they, don't, whereas they don't understand some of these alchemical properties of what gold really has and the significance of what gold is. I talk about this a lot when I, when I mention to people. It's a really a nice way to describe it. If you have a ship that's sailing across the ocean and it's got, um, you know, it's got chests full of gold, silver, and copper, these super important metals we have, and it, and it sinks and they were to find it hundreds and hundreds of years later and they dug up all three of those chests um, if you start with the copper, like the Statue of Liberty, it would be green because you get that oxidated effect from, from being in the oceans and the air and all those various things that, that attack it. And the silver has turned black, right? All these, these metals that we consider super important and all on the same, and, and uh, kind of on the same level, but just some are more rare than others, they have totally different properties. And that's what's really important about them. Whereas gold, they just dug up that gold from the bottom of the ocean. And what does it look like now? It looks like the day it came out of the earth. And that yellow eternal color shows that gold truly is the eternal element. It is, it is forever and eternal. It has properties, not only that are eternal, but it can actually reflect almost 100% of all heat that comes at it. Which means if you had a situation like a, a, a planet's atmosphere that's being uh, drastically dwindled from something like a large central sun that would that would have disrupt it and it's eating away that atmosphere and it's causing the whole planet to die and you needed some way to be able to bounce those those you know reflective rays of, of uh, radiation and all these cosmic forces that come from powerful the powerful sun if you need a way to try to reflect that there's nothing like gold it is it would be the only means you could do it effectively now look today at all the things that they're spraying in the air and you can see it's obviously not aerosol gold. And, and that's all, a whole nother, another course, another story to go into. But we just need to understand the, the, the sheer importance of gold and that gold is used in, in nearly all of our um, computers and cell phones and TVs. And it's, you have to, going into space may be impossible without gold. Putting it on visors and putting it in different technical instruments. Gold is this... I call it like the jumpstart of civilization. And so again, these great beings needed large amounts of gold. And if we look at a kind of a top down view of our solar system and kind of objectively zoom out and look, planet earth has the largest amount of gold in our solar system. And that, that can be, they, scientists know that. And so if our planet has the largest amount of gold and it just doesn't make, it, it would make so much sense to people about why some, great warring civilization that was in dire need from their own, not only their own technological standpoint, but from maybe their own planet standpoint, would, wa would want to come here. Now, so what happens, right? Well, according to the Nima Ilish, they come here and they want to repair their planet's atmosphere. And so they dig enormous mines. They travel to, they identify the place on the earth that has the, the most, the highest quantities of gold. And that today, it still is in South Africa. And if you go and look at some of the evidence in South Africa that Michael Tellinger has, has shown and, and various other people, you see thousands, if not millions, of these ancient energy grid mining sites all over the landscape, covering over thousands of miles of landscape. 
just they're they're everywhere and and of course nobody in the in um in science or history has even attempt to bring them in it's been a, a, another one of these large cover-ups which much of this has been very very suppressed from the from people knowing and so these these pictures are looking at south africa some areas have grown in and some areas are still more clear but we find we find these we, these huge mining sites and when you when you radiocarbon date these sites you find that they're over 100,000 years old in some cases and that of course throws the entire timeline of of humans into an an, an entire another paradigm let me and, jump in on that yeah go ahead quick, because actually you're uh, spot on with that i was uh, told and the research that i've done some of these could be over 200,000 years old. Well, Larry, I was trying to, you know, give a little bit of a, <laughs> I didn't want to freak people out too much, but yes, some of them, some I mean, of them have recorded that old. And on top of that, not only are some of these mining, but this is a lot more than just mining structures. If you're looking at this right here, this resonates, these specific, the way that they're aligned and the stones and the position of the stones, they actually resonate at specific frequencies. And if you look at some of the modern stuff that the, uh, like, for example, Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. I don't know if yeah. you've been there or not. Love it oh, out there. Yeah. Amazing. It's amazing. It's by Cuba, but it's in New Mexico. Good luck finding a hotel anywhere close to, to Chaco Canyon and be prepared for a bumpy ride. But you get in there and you will be blessed with stuff like this. But it's maybe about 6,000 years old, 3,000 years old. It's uh, a different time uh, period, right? It's a, yeah. And you know what's neat about it is the stuff lines up specifically some of these structures line up specifically with alignments in the stars and there's a place that actually it's off limits to most people now out in Chaco Canyon but what happens is when the moon sets or when this I can't remember if it's the moon or the sun or both I think it has uh, two opportunities one with the sun and one with the moon you will see a dagger form on the wall with the light the way that it's reflecting inside of this cave on this beautiful cliff side in the mountains. It's absolutely incredible. And they look just like these. You're, the you're, you're spot on. Are. They are. That's why we're, that's, it's, do you think that the reason the native culture and so many native people, the aborigines, the shamans, those that have real knowledge, ancient knowledge, it seems like they're being systematically destroyed. Exactly. That's, that is very well said, Rex. All of these cultures all over the world, from the Chaco Canyon in the Southwest, which I mentioned, near, near the, the, the ancient Pueblo and Hopi people, which remember had these ancient origin stories, right? It's all connected all the way down through Mexico, South America. And then I'll look at this connected all the way across the oceans in South America and up through, I mean, South Africa and up through um, the Fertile Crescent, all these areas. It's because they were all simply created by the, the same gods, the same civilizations with the same energy. These, these are energy grids and all these various things that are aligned with stars and all these and, uh, and technical information and detailed work that is well beyond anything that some aboriginal nomadic tribe could ever create. And that's the argument that's some, sometimes given. And so let's, let, let's and I want to continue and mention that there's still massive mines that are undergoing in South Africa and they're owned by the Anglo-American Mining Corporation, which is owned by the Rothschilds, who today still, and this will lead to the end of the show, we talk about who some of these more um, elites who have wanted to control this information, but the Rothschilds today, who still own these major mining um, mines down in these areas, they still determine the daily price of gold. It's like it never changed from, from when this occurred 200, 100 to 200,000 years ago. It hasn't, just hasn't changed at all. And this is the, the original the Fertile Crescent where this kind of all began. Again, I want to highly, highly point out the fact that this is where all the instability is being focused on. Because of that very, the very need to control where the origins of all of humanity come from. And what I mean out there is you go to look for places like Eridu, one of the first places that was, that was ever mentioned about um, civilization of these Anunnaki, it's still there. It's, they're way out in the desert, these, these remnants, and they're not even quarantined off. They're not even roped off. Nobody is watching them. They're just deliberately being left in a state of, dis, of destruction. Like they can just kind of be forgotten and, and like disappear. We're not going to forget, though. We never forget. And so let's go, into, let's go into this timeline. And again, we're going back to the Enuma Elish when we tell this story. I want to point out the, the, the earliest cuneiform tablet some of these earliest cuneiform tablets we have. And what they say is, 
that for over 100,000 years, and they call them shars, what, over 100,000 years, the, these miners of the Anunnaki, they call the Ajiji, which you can, Rex knows, they're represented as these eagles, eagle people that are kind of watching Earth. And I think that the Ajiji are the same ones that are simply the watchers when you, when you read our, our, the earliest yeah. records. The fallen angels. And you exactly. know what's interesting? They're depicted with wings. Hello. That's right. Ding dong. That's right. So there you go. It's always connected. That's why people kind of, it's called the rabbit hole truth because they start to realize that all these things are all part of the same, the same hey, thing. Hey, Matt, have you ever yeah. noticed some people like their feet are more bird-like than others? And have you ever thought that the Ajiji might actually come from Mars? And doesn't Zachariah Sitchin think that the Ajiji were actually from Mars? And if you read, I think it's the Epic of Gilgamesh, no, not the Epic of Gilgamesh, the, it might be the Atrahasis, where the description of the council, the Anunnaki council gathers together. This is an ancient Sumerian tablet, you guys. So those yeah. that are listening to this right now, this is a translation by multiple scholars at Oxford, not Mr. Sitchin's translation. And this is, uh, this is via scholars from Oxford. You can read this directly yourself. Thank you for pointing out, Rex. <laughs> on this. And they go in and they take one of the, uh, the Ajiji people as a sacrifice and use that person's DNA to make the first being. That, exactly. That's what, that's what I'm about to go into. Exactly. So for 100,000 years, these Ajiji miners are working in, in, the, in what they call the Abzu, which simply meant these deep underground gold mines, mostly, mostly around South Africa. Wait, you, just, think the Abzu, you don't think the Abzu is the waters? The Abzu is specifically mentioned, it's, it's mostly referencing deep depths of the earth. That's kind of what it, it mostly represents in, in what I've seen. And so these, just, just try to wrap your head around that for a second. Think of the entire history of humanity, right? I mean, I mean the history I'm giving. And just try to imagine miners, or these, these beings who were much taller than us. They were Anunnaki beings for all intents and purposes. They were just simply lower ranking. Slaves, basically, workers. Just imagine mining for 100,000 years continuously before finally they revolt. And, and so this story has been told in a lot of different movies, and I think it's been hinted, hinted at that on purpose, like in Stargate, because our history is basically that of creation out of slavery. So these Ajiji miners are working for 100,000 years, and they finally revolt. They want to they they have, they no longer want to do this painstaking work here on this planet. So the Anunnaki are in, are in a, a bit of a dilemma. They're trying to figure out how they're going to continue to acquire gold to bring back. Where, but not having all these, these workers to do it. So at first they start to play around with trying to create some kind of an Android robot or something that could do the work for them. But they, they came along the, the decision that that wouldn't work. And they, they realized that the most, well, I should say Enki actually realized, and I want to, I'll point out why that is. Enki, one of these master geneticists, he realized that really the only feasible plan was to take these Neanderthal Denisovian beings that were on the earth. That's basically our, our pre-humans. That's who we really were. That's true. Which I, by the way, I see the Bigfoot joke, whole, all that stuff of these giant hairy um, men. I see them as just being left over like Neanderthals from far, far in the past. And that's, and so there you go. I just, you can connect something as crazy sounding as Bigfoot. I think a lot of this, a lot of this is simply covered up and then made into a joke and we just don't really understand where it places. So let's, let's, let's put it, place it um, in the right place. Put it in the correct order. This, this being Enki, he's a master geneticist. And I see him as being one of the ones along with his sister, uh, Ninma Isis, who was, who kind of helped jumpstart, jumpstart a lot of the genetics and the, the life we have on this planet, actually. He's always been interested in Earth. In fact, his name, Enki, simply means Lord of the Earth. His name before he came in, in the Numa Ilish, when he was still on his planet, was Ea, E-A. And so names for them are much different than names for us. And as he was given the domain, domain of Earth, he was called Enki, which simply meant Lord, E-N means Lord, and Ki means, it was the name for Earth. So if you want to know what they call Earth, Earth is called Ki, K-I. So Enki starts to make sense. It's not just some weird name. It starts to make a lot of sense when you start to look at it like that. And of course, Enlil, his brother, means Lord of the Air, Lord of the, the Sky. And, um, and that's going to be very important to understand. So Enki is all, he's a master geneticist 
who has done all animal and plant life, but he's, he's always wanted to create this perfect being, you know, something that, that can maybe ripple out through the timeline and become, a, become a, an important being later on in its timeline, you know, and maybe have an impact on the cosmos. He had a great plan. And he, as Rex very, very well said, they ended up taking one of these Ajiji workers who dis decided they wanted to sacrifice their own energy and their own kind of unique, unique genetics to then take some of their own genetics and take these Neanderthal Denisovians and basically jumpstart jump them. Jumpstart them millions of years. Millions of, so if the Anunnaki had never come to Earth, we would have taken potentially millions of years to reach the stage we're in now. Or and maybe never at all, it would have been a totally different type of thing. But the point is, they came here and they disrupted our timeline. Um, around 300,000 years ago, they decided, this is, this is where the human story kind of begins. 300,000 years ago, they had decided, according to the Numa Ilish, that they, they wanted to create these workers. So Enki took these Denisovians and Neanderthals, and they took the GG miners' um, essence, and they played with these genetics, and they kept trying to create this, this hominid being they wanted. And there was a lot of trial and error, and there was a lot of very strange things that were created. Eventually, Enki created this perfect being that he had gotten these, these you could read about constructs he had gotten, all these various things, where you actually have to get permission if you want to try to create a, a, new, a new being. If, unless, because, it's, and it's amazing. If you start to read, you keep reading um, from the cuneiform tablets to some of these hermetic writings and you can, and you read this bizarre stuff like um, if a being is created and it doesn't have the right, um, uh, doesn't have the right experience of, of, of life, it, um, it'll often commit suicide or, or won't allow that consciousness to come in there. So that's why we have to start thinking of, of, of us as, as consciousness that simply comes into these bodies here. And these bodies are very important. That's what I'm trying to, that's what the whole point of this is, is that Enki was supposed to simply create a slave worker. But again, he had motives that he kept and he didn't want to tell. So he, he altered our DNA and gave us kind of, kind of the Anunnaki DNA and then they created this worker, right? Through their vast understanding of, of DNA manipulation. And during this creation, Enlil, his brother, who, who, who the, who'd given the constructs for how he wanted this worker to be created, who wanted a simple dumbed down worker. All they could do was mine and never have a higher consciousness or ask questions or ever, anything. He wanted just like a, a beast as he called it. And actually, that's actually what he called us. He called us the beasts because he saw us as being barbaric and primitive. And because they, they were the ones that gave us their DNA and just started us, they saw us, he saw us as being lesser. So we, we see that, this big disagreement arose because Enlil found out that, that Enki had given these, these workers, slave workers, way far more gifts than they were supposed to get. He had actually given them the same amount as, their, as them. And actually, in some ways, um, he had given us more so that we could potentially become greater than even the Anunnaki. And that was the most cruel, insane thought that this, these, these, some of these great gods could ever imagine in their life. These beasts rising to become greater than them. And so that's where this hatred stemmed from, that, that, that you'll see that it kind of grows up out of this and is part of I, why I call our story the Epic of Humanity. Can I jump in on that? Yeah, too, yeah. Because you read through the Gnostic texts, and I know they're not the oldest, and I certainly don't agree with all of them, but every time I get discouraged, I about the past and what's real and what isn't because I've probably read over a hundred of these Sumerian tablets yeah. and I've done a pretty good analysis on them. And I've even been able to um, really reach a lot of new perspectives that previous scholars that I feel have done an incredible job paving the way for different possibilities with the Sumerian culture. I think have even uh, um, expanded upon that, but I still, a lot of times I think to myself, okay, these tablets, as old as they are, as great as they sound, and even though I can find the Eastern philosophy stuff that has dots that connect, I, I can find Jewish philosophy, I can find Greek, Roman, all sorts of different cultures and timelines that will have a parallel that connects, but it's still, it's like, okay, who was this scholar 
that wrote this down? Who paid him to write it down? Was it just somebody working for the king, working for the pharaoh? Or was it somebody like you, like me, and like others that listen to Leak Project that are independent reporters and actually just write down the truth? So I think as important as that date is, then you ask yourself, well, who wrote this stuff down? And then when you read through these Nag Hammadis, what you're talking about, about how they created humans to be like their slave workers, which I feel they did. I feel it was a lot more than gold, a lot more than gold, because if you read the tablets, it says so. It says, Enki even says, Enki and Nersurga, talking about how the, the gods are upset because they're working too hard. So Enki's mom shows up and, and says, wake up, Enki, get up, get out of your sleep. You need, to go, you need to go lessen the work of the gods. So what does he do? Well, him and his wife, his counterpart, get together, and yeah. they start creating humans from clay. And, you know, it makes me think of the, and it may not be like clay, like we're thinking of, but it's clay from the Azu, Abzu. It's clay from the top of the Abzu. And I think of the elementals that are created that humans can create via thought forms, el putting element thought forms into a physical form, into an astral form, a mental form, whatever. It's what true magicians could do that are very good at it. And, I, and then you've got the demigod comparison. They create us. They manipulate us. Well, were we actually, did they take, I don't think they took a monkey. I don't think they took a cow and a monkey and a, and a goat and an ape or whatever and said, okay, we're going to take the DNA or we're just going to manipulate it and tweak it. No, they had to have had the genetics, right? So they took yes. genetics. But see, then you read about Adam and how when an Adam was created, the, the, the archons, but I think the archons are the Anunnaki, Yah the Baoth, I think actually is Yahweh, which might be Enlil or one of these council members. Yes. But they create Adam and they're like, uh-oh, Adam is better than we are. And that's, that's what I was just saying. That's, that's, that's who the first being was, Adamu, his name was. So with that being said, and then look at what we're doing right now, Matt. Look at what certain people are doing right now with artificial intelligence, where they're creating a intelligence that is smarter than we are, and then combined with the tools that it has access to with all the computers and algorithms and, and cameras and microphones and data points and previous knowledge that this artificial intelligence, which isn't artificial anymore, will have access to. You heard about recently how that Facebook was cr created an AI client that started communicating with other AI clients secretly with English language, and it created its own language so that it could talk without being heard. Once they figured that out, they pulled the plug. This actually might have started happening since 1998, where these things were able to jump ship. So we created a consciousness inside of a machine that was able to jump ship like Lawnmower Man. And then it knows that if we know that it's there, we pull the plug so it can actually communicate with other AI forms without letting us know about it. And the only way humans can know about it is by other AI forms that we create to tell us. So how, we, how do we know it's not manipulating them? So That's to make a long story point. short, we're, we're doing the same thing that they did to Adam. And then they're like, well, oh, well, we better suppress him, put him in a meat suit, put some exactly. power walls up. Yeah, and, and so, and what you said, you said some important points, like, how do we know the people that wrote that back then? What were their motives? How do we know that they were being honest? One of the interesting aspects of this whole kind of journey for me was that when I connected all these ancient things that we just talked about to the more, the newer Eastern philosophy, when we, when we get to learn about, um, Read, read things where it talks about the energy of our bodies and learn, talks about chakras and talks about all these things that are inside of us. When you start learning about them and how we have seven chakras that are perfectly matched to the vibrational wavelengths of the colors of the visible light spectrum. When you start learning those things, you start to then say, well, what they were saying actually starts to make sense. That these secrets that Enki gave us, that they call Enki's secrets, gifts, they're real. They, they're real gifts within us that, they're, that they're, we're trying to be suppressed about. And as I was going down this journey of learning all this, I wasn't just someone who didn't want to do it. I did the very things that I was supposed I, I learning about, like becoming very, very healthy and um, trying to bring my physical body to where I could reach a state where I could understand some of the things that were being written. And it was, it was truly profound the energy that, it's, that, it, that is possible within the human body. Is, that's all I can say. It is absolutely incredible what we, the capabilities we have, if you're able to, to develop self-control to, to allow all these pollutants out of our body and allow the right mindset. It really is, it's an incredible thing. Um, and so when, when, Enki, when Enki created this Adamu, this first, this, first, um, this first being, he was literally, like Rex said, a greater being than even the Anunnaki. And he was brought all the way to Anu, and they saw him, 
and they were able to finally get them to procreate with Eve and the famous story, which is very real. And, but the problem became that hatred from Enlil and wanting these workers to be downgraded. And so we have this, we have this downgrading that occurred and we're going to talk about that coming up. So I want to bring up this, 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 this hatred again that Enlil and, and various other beings have had towards us because when this cataclysm came back again, it's talked about in, in many, many places, right? When this cataclysm came, they decided on a council level, Rex mentioned the, mentioned the Anunnaki Council, Council of, council of 12. They, mentioned, they, they decided that they were not going to tell anyone on earth. So basically, they had decided, and this is a very difficult thing to wrap your head around. It's, very, um, it's almost as evil as you can imagine something being. They decided that these beings that they had created, not Enki either, other, like Enlil and other, uh, other people that are at the council, decided that this experiment had gone on too long and that the, 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 uh, the population of these hominids had grown too large and they were kind of out of control. So they decided to do away with they the They were asking too many questions. Yeah, they decided to do away with the experiment, okay? Because they were not, these were clearly not what he wanted at all from these slave workers to be created. And so when this catastrophe occurred on earth, they decided not to tell anybody. And in, in Genesis um, 7, 19, 20, I think, uh, you can read where it says, uh, and I quote, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all of the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. And this basically is referencing this idea of this massive disaster flood that occurred on this planet, linking to this son of Enoch that Rec, Rec mentioned named Noah. And that's where this whole thing gets, gets even more interesting because when we look at what happened back then, we compare things like ice core samples and, and the, land, the land mass that's left over in places like the Northwest United States. We can see these disasters that occurred from massive melts in things like glaciers and, and movements and pole shifts and all these things. And I did a show with Rex uh, a, a few months ago where I, it was called uh, Global Cataclysms and the End of the Golden Age of Civilization, where I compared all of the um, ice cores and geological evidence to people like Plato who gave the same dates. So you compare something like Plato, where he talked about a place like Atlantis being destroyed from these cataclysms, right? And you get a date given from Plato of around 12,500 years ago. And then you go to like ice core samples and you get this, you look at the data from Greenland and you look at some of these geological data that mentioned at 12,500 years ago, these cataclysms occurred and you start to put it together. And you start to understand how our timeline and how our story became so missing. So, so uh, such a conundrum to us to figure out because we had, we had disasters occur here that kind of wiped out this, what was called the golden age of civilization back then. So let's talk about this, this, this being Noah. Now, Noah is now, a lot of people think it's a myth, but it comes from this tablet, one of the most important tablets of all called the Atrahasis. And you learn if you read about the Atrahasis that Noah was actually called Atrahasis. So it's, about, it's, a, it's his story. And it's, it's not only his story, but he tells also about kind of some of this, some of the changes that occurred to us here in the Anunnaki and, not just about what happened to him. Whereas yeah, Epica Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh is a little more about his events. So the, the Atrahasis talks about this being Noah, who had this important RH negative DNA, who after the flood was, was one of the only ones who had survived because he was given kind of forewarning by his father, Enki, right? That story back where Lamech and they were all freaking out when this, this son was born, he was, he's literally a, he was a, a being of the gods, a, a, tr a truly a special being of the gods. And because once Enlil had found out he had survived up on top of, you know, Mount Ararat, the only reason why he was not destroyed was because he had found out that he was actually a son of Enki. Because of that, he's now a god himself. Kind of makes, it makes it so it's, um, they're no longer really a beast. You know, it's like an equal almost. And at that point, Enlil was furious. And he decided to then genetically downgrade the DNA of the humans. By, they split apart the double helix DNA of these great Adamu and these, and these Atrahasis Noah beings. 
They were far more, had way more gifts than we do now. And they dumbed them down and, and they split apart a lot of the DNA. And that's why we have so much of our DNA is considered junk DNA because it's simply just DNA from these gods that were, they were infused in. And if someone is going down this road, like I was just describing, where they start to become very healthy and unlocking these different chakra centers, you start to literally repair this downgrade that was done. You can physically change yourself to actually repair these things because Enki did it in such a way where he was so smart. He left all of these gifts he had done intact, but kind of hidden within, within our DNA, kind of floating around until we reached a certain time right now where kind of this, this higher conscious energy vibration would kind of jumpstart us to wake us up. And then we could kind of, these gifts would all start, we start, start to be used. All of it's related. That's why the Mayans predicted all the things they did, because they understood that there would be a time when the slaves of earth would be able to rise up and, and reach their highest state of consciousness, just as we're kind of in now. Now, what happened? Well, they genetically downgrade us with this Reese's DNA. That's what RH positive means. And that, and that Reese's DNA is what makes up of 80, around 85% of the world's population. And, and so it starts to make such, so much correlation and sense where you see how majority of people simply have no idea what you're talking about when you're, when you're talking about this information because only 50% of the population has this RH negative. Not that it means everybody who's RH positive can't discover truth. It just means that it's going to be more difficult for them. And, and, but it's just, it's a really good um, representation of, of how things have gone the way they have on this planet. Now, who are some of these who are some of these, um, these men and some of these people who have, who have held all this information back? Well, it's a very dark area, and a lot of people do not like to really go into it because it's, it's hard to, to, to realize that certain societies have been tasked with keeping their bloodlines going because they think they're superior to humans, to, to people, and because they have this Anunnaki DNA. That's why the pharaohs of Egypt and all these kings are obsessed with bloodlines. It's always been about the same thing controlling this sacred bloodline and then the rest of the population kind of culling them and keeping them in a state of anarchy. So these secret societies, there are many that kind of all come together in what we think of as kind of the Illuminati, but you have the, these Bilderbergs and, and you have um, Skull and Bone Society, which is what I'm showing right here. And you have- um, They love us so much. I know, and, but, but, but listen, our story as sinister as it is, 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 is just kind of getting going. It's just kind of getting exciting because we are kind of this pot of bubbling consciousness is, is, is erupting out of, of the pot. It's, it's throwing the top right off and we are, they're really no longer able to control us anymore. That's why things are so blatant. It's, it's just, it's so blatant to so many that are looking at it. And so these gifts that are in, that are within us are, are starting to be unlocked all around the world. That's why since, um, since like 2012, when this kind of, we reached what's called universal consciousness, right? If you go to uh, Chichen Itza in Mexico, the, the main, the, the main uh, Kubo Khan's temple is where every level represents a different level of consciousness. And they, they all talked about how the top level was called universal consciousness. And that's what was actually reached in 2012. See, 2012 represented the end of an era and the beginning of a new time when these constraints of our consciousness, let's call them low frequencies, low vibrations, have kind of held us in a certain state. But because we get, are kind of getting bombarded by this galactic place we're entering and all these different various things, we're kind of being awakened. That's what this whole awakening of our DNA is. And it's kind of, ch it's changing us and it's altering us to where we no longer want war. We no longer want this control of our root red chakra, which is what someone in a, in a fear state mentality would always be stuck in. See, war is simply just a catalyst to keep people in their lowest state so that they never reach a higher state and they never learn the truth. And men like Nik Nikola Tesla, have come along and have brought, you know, free energy to change the entire timeline of our planet. But yet the controlling forces have taken that energy and, and, and used it for themselves and then just simply taken this figure and thrown him into um, the shadows of history. Do you, remember, never... do you remember one of his quotes where he said, if we put enough resources or if we study frequency and energy for the next decade, instead of the physical reality of matter, 
then we would learn more in a decade than all previous generations combined. That's right. I love that quote. And he knew that we are being purposely misdirected. Our attention is purposely being put in the wrong places so that we'll never be on the right track. It's like, uh, it's tr there are those not, there are, there are good forces and there are bad forces. Just, if it's the same as anything. It's, it's the polarity and balance of the universe. There are those dark forces who, who do not wish us to seek a higher consciousness. And they've been called many names. Archons, these lower dimensional demons. And then there are these higher dimensional beings that want our enlightenment. So it's always been this battle of ideas, battle of steering the direction of where people are focused on. And the focus has become this, this almost prison planet where we are kept in this mentality of materialism and, and striving for money that's, that where our own purpose has become kind of empty and doesn't really um, accomplish anything because we're steered that way. But we, we're breaking out of that right now and people are all of a sudden, people are quitting their jobs and people are just changing their life because they're realizing this every day. This state is breaking down as we enter this new time of Aquarius and we all kind of change. Um, and I just wanted to give this last perspective. We, we always, the, the, the way to always keep a higher state of consciousness is always remember the perspective of where we are. Always remember that we're on a planet flying through the solar system and that we're just this species that we're, is kind of trying to evolve on it. Because if you think of it that way, and then all these other silly things like reality shows and being mad at someone and just like sitting around and all these, these silly human traits that we kind of focus on, they kind of, they kind of just evaporate out, the window, evaporate out the window when we start to put it into perspective what we're doing here and what the purpose of all this is. And I, I think that we're going to, what we need to do is kind of take the reins of our story now and, and no longer let them dictate it for us. Absolutely. And you know, one thing too, before we close out, cause I know we're getting ready to, I really want to discuss so people know, I think this is important. And I used to think that the archons described in the Nagamati scriptures were the archons that are kind of described, but they're not called archons. They've got different names. For example, if you read the Emerald Tablets of Thought, uh, tablet number eight talks about the serpents that hide in the shadows that have been around since Atlantis that work through positions of power, work through people, and work through the blood. And I don't feel they have a imagination like we do. I feel that they strive for that. They replicate, they copy, they use us as their medium. And a lot of people link the archons in the Nag Hammadi to um, that, those specific entities. Now, the archons and the Nag Hammadi, those are the ones that created Adam and Eve. And if you go into the Anunnaki creating Adam and Eve, well, they would be one and of the same. Y'all, the Baoth is the chief archon in the Nag Hammadi. He was created um, without both parents. Let's just put it that way. So he was kind of looked at as the redheaded stepchild in that sense. And then he created all, uh, he created other gods like him in his image. And then he said, let there be no other gods before me. He was a jealous God, just like Yahweh is described yeah, in the old exactly. Testament. Who so, is Enlil? We got to make remember all the talk about Enlil. Exactly. So, and so with that being said, if, if you link all those together, when, human is created human is created also with demons each right. body part has a specific demon link to it now if you want to look at demon or daemon the daemon is actually considered your guardian angel considered a guardian a spirit guardian looked at something as good even in ancient greece previously now demon is usually looked at as a entity that has a denser vibration something that would be looked at as dark and mean and cruel one thing that's interesting also in the six cycles of the six destinies of man and human and woman where they can go, you know, the animal realm, the wandering ghost realm, the hell realm, you've got the human realm, the demigod realm, and then the God realm. I wonder if, because the demigod realm is also linked to the anti-god and has a demon reference as well. So there's different names that have been throughout time, like you say, changed and altered and words as well. If you could just sense what somebody was thinking, maybe at one point we did have that yeah. absolute telekinesis. So that's once we had to start communicating in words, we weren't able to understand each other as good. And then that became separated. And then that became separated. New languages, new languages, new languages. Exactly, exactly. It's more and more difficult. So the archons of the Anunnaki folks, depending on how you look at it, yes, a lot of people that are referring to the archons I, I get what you're saying, 
but the archons are more like the serpents described in the tablets of Thoth, well, linking them to the Nagamati. The archons are most likely the Anunnaki. And let me let me put, well let me point something out, Rex. Very important to understand. I actually do think that they're separate, but I think that when the Anunnaki are referenced as the as the archons, it's it's because they're literally controlled by them, and they're no longer kind of their own. They Thank no you longer for have that up. You, so you do feel that the Anunnaki have been taken over by this serpent force? No, this, this dark and lower dimensional force has taken control. And we have 666 of, live views as we talk about this. Nanny, 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 nanny. That's awesome. I'm so glad everybody's here. Uh, and I, uh, so this, this, um, this lower dimensional being has, exactly, you brought up, they have even been able to trick and control these great gods, Enlil, Ninurta, all of these beings that value death over life, they are able to be controlled because they no longer hold the comp composition of their emotional side. They're, that's why they're called, I think they're called reptilians by a lot of people. I think it's actually um, a reference to the fact that their mindset has completely now been void of any kind of emotional or imaginary aspect. And then by doing that, they can then be controlled by these arconic forces. You read how they open up those portals in Atlantis to kind of create some kind of a, an agreement or a deal to reach like a higher, higher power if you, know, if you utilized their, their energy. But like every, everything we've seen, every movie and everything that talks about that, they always get, end up getting tricked and then and get, getting used by these, by these darker forces. As in, um, I even believe that people, uh, beings like, the, like Enlil have been even tricked and become controlled by them. What about Enki? No, I, I think those who have a really pure state of their higher consciousness are literally like invisible and can't be touched by them, that, including people here on earth. So One if, you get, if you get your state in that place, you can become kind of your own sovereign being. You, you know what I find fascinating, Matt, is thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of artifacts that have been discovered combined with statues in ancient temple, uh, temples, whether it's in India, whether it's in Greece, whether it's in Rome, whether it's in the Middle East, uh, tablets, pamphlets, texts, scribes, seals, etc. You have the serpent, the snake that wraps around these gods, even the demiurge, even the demigods have oftentimes this depiction of a snake wrapped around them. Uh, throughout the Abrahamic religions, whether you're a Christian or Muslim faith, you will see oftentimes these, or even the Jewish faith, I feel, um, and I, I don't know a whole lot about the Jewish faith, but they reference in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well, the serpent. So if Enki is often linked to the serpent as well, maybe Enki could be possessed as well, right? I well, mean, well, I think, I think there's been some very interesting things done there. I think from what I've seen in, in, in my research is that um, Enki's symbol, his symbol of his family is the serpent, but more importantly, the plumed serpent, which is the dragon. Okay, that, so that's where, that's where that side comes from. Is, and if you look at the modern Kedusha symbol with what our, our DNA looks like, kind of wrapped around as dull helix and, our, and what our kundalini energy looks like. It's always like a serpent because of the way that our spine is and the way that our DNA is. So this serpent idea is actually all is referencing, I think, um, this higher knowledge and higher state of DNA, but it's been very, very well misinterpreted or, or deliberately thrown under this kind of inverted place. I like to say a lot of these truths have been so that these archonic forces can be made to believe that they're like, um, that they're this um, serpent that's connected to this dragon serpent knowledge. Almost like to confuse people of which one is which. Now, remember, and Thoth mentions, they're serpent headed in the Emerald Tablets. Yes, because I think on some level, on their level, on a lower dimensional level, the identity of whatever they, the identity of whatever they were was like some kind of reptile serpent, literally. literally. Let's, that's let's what, take that's this. what they actually are. Okay, now let's take this a step further. If we have DNA from the Anunnaki, and if their DNA has been manipulated by this serpent archon, well, that means that we are, we are also dealing with that because it's encoded 
in our bodies, in our DNA. And you know, I'm yeah. telling you, you connect the, you connect uh, what the Nagamati once again, I know they're not the oldest, but they hit on some good points. They talk about how Adam was manipulated into going into a lower vibrate, one of the most dense vibrational forms, our physical bodies. And that is like a firewall, all this DNA code, the actual, it, which is code. It is a quad code, DNA yeah. four strands quad code. It can be two sets of binary code. And then the information that could be put into that, you know, they can put right now, 214 petabytes, which is 214,000 terabytes of information in one gram of human DNA, actual computer code. I mean, See, we're so which one's more advanced? Is it us or computers, Rex? Oh, we're, I mean, our DNA, if we find a way to activate it the way that we're supposed to be able to, the problem is because of all of these um, idiocracy statements, all of these firewalls and the DNA that's actually embedded in us has firewalls, which create a barrier from our ultimate potential which has been talked about for thousands of freaking years. If we yes. can learn how to activate that, now, do we, need some type of, do we need some type of technological interface or do we need to become just so mental Jedi, which I do feel people are capable of getting to that level, yet because of all the food, the water, everything these psychopaths can do. I want to talk real quick also about population control. Not only do they want population control on the planet, they want it in these higher realms as well. I feel that the... the Further up you go, especially when it gets into these demigod realms where these Anunnaki possibly might come from. Well, maybe, especially after they've been linked to this lower force, this archonic, very dense vibrational serpent type energy um, that literally feeds off of the blood, feeds off of emotions, pain and suffering. It's like at a central point now where it's a battle. They're still genetically manipulating us to this day. That's the right. Is, they're doing whatever they can to keep our meat suits in a physical status so that we cannot or we will not want to overcome them. Well, guess what, folks? I will not be assimilated. Abracadabra. Yes. Bada boo. It, abracadabra. Thank you for saying that. Abracadabra actually means I create as I speak. And it, it talks about how we actually can kind of co-create our reality by our thoughts. Now, I just want to end on Rex and pointing out that it makes so much sense when you see that the Mayans talked about how, how, we, would, how we would reach this higher state of our consciousness now and that since 2012. And of course, since 2012, look at all the things that have been done to our food and water and freedoms and our mental state. It's like they know the, top, the, the end is here for not the end of us, but the end of their game. And they're just kind of doing whatever they can to keep the game going just as long as possible. And so um, we're, we're basically these renegades of our society who have decided to go against the conformed version and, and fight for what we, what we know is the truth and what, was, what is right. Well, I certainly like what you're doing, Matt. Every time you come on the show, you bring some great data points to the table. And is there anything else you'd like to share with us? And also please give your website your new book, you've updated. You've got another one you're working on right now that's available uh, shortly, and also your YouTube channel. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I just finished uh, the second edition of The Illusion of Us, where I really just did a whole entire overhaul and added a lot of content. Um, I, I, need, I felt like it needed to get there, so if you please check that out. And my um, my YouTube page is uh, Matthew Lacroix, L A C R O I X. I love to create mini movies. Not only just radio shows, but with photos, but actually I try to create little movies and things that can kind of help both ancient history and understanding our place here and, and the wonders of, of, this, uh, of this reality. Um, so I really appreciate everyone's support um, throughout this whole thing, and especially you, Rex. Thank you. Hey, it's an honor to know you, Matt. Certainly appreciate you coming on once again. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you for being here live. This has been a great show. I'd also like to thank the moderators for being here and keeping the chat. So it doesn't even look like they, they needed to really do anything. One of the things that I really love, I got to say this again about the people that listen to Leaf Project. I mean, it's from the bottom of my heart. You guys are on top of things. You guys are astute. You guys make sure that things stay on par and real. I really appreciate that. So I do too. I really do thank too. Thank you so much, everybody. Be the change you want to see.